بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل لعبادي يقول التي هي أحسن إن الشيطان ينزغ بينهم إن الشيطان كان للإنسان عدوا مبينا صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters Our topic of discussion tonight is yet once again a very vital and integral topic and that is peaceful coexistence. Once a particular Imam walked into the masjid addressing the congregation, he said, Today I have two things before you. I have good news and I have bad news. Good news is that we now have sufficient funds to complete our masjid project and we have had enough funds to complete the adjacent that is attached to the masjid for the institution purpose that's the good news now comes the bad news the bad news is the money is still in your pockets in that very same vein I say to you we have good news that as Muslims we have the formula to rescue the world from the turmoil and the turbulence that it is experiencing the bad news is that we are hoarding the formula. The bad news is that the formula is in my pocket. It's in my booklet. It's in my shelf. If only we can rise up to the challenge of the hour and exhibit the exemplary character and manifest the impeccable qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then as I will endeavor to explain, you would see the magnetic impact it would have on the broader people across the globe. The narration is mentioned in Tibrani. The Prophet ﷺ exits from one of the apartments of his honorable consorts. With him is Ali radiallahu anhu. فَأَتَاهُ رَجُلٌ عَلَىٰ رَاحِلَتِهِ كَالْبَدَوِي when suddenly a person advances towards him, mounted on his conveyance, looked like a Bedouin. He came and he said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I have invited my people to Islam and they have accepted the message and I promised them material prosperity. On the reverse, وَقَدْ أَصَابَتْهُمْ سَنَةٌ by the will of Allah, they've been gripped by famine and drought. I'm afraid that this adversity and this famine must not have a reverse effect upon them. They entered passionately. It must not be that they forsake Islam quickly. If you have any monetary assistance, would you kindly pass it on to me? Perhaps I could rescue their plight through monetary aid. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam modestly gazed at Ali who was with him and asked him, do we have anything at hand? He said, oh Nabi of Allah, the funds are depleted. It's exhausted. We don't have anything. Just then this gentleman comes forward who was of a Jewish faith. Nay, he was a rabbi. He was a priest. Zayd ibn Su'na. He said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm prepared to give you money if you can give me dates after a period of time. 
I can see you are in need of some funds. The Prophet ﷺ said, that's fine. Took the money now and made a deal that he would be paid the dates that he has asked for in due time. Nabi ﷺ took the money, gave it to the Bedouin and said, Aghithum wa'adil bainahum. Use the money, apply your mind and distribute it fairly amongst these people who have reverted to Islam. This particular happening ended, concluded. The villager went. The Prophet ﷺ and Ali moved on. Zayd ibn Su'na, the Jewish rabbi, left. There was a time that was fixed that within this time the money would be paid back to him. A day before the time had lapsed. So there was one more day of grace left to the Prophet ﷺ. And Zayd ibn Su'na comes, comes from the rear and he harshly grips the blessed garment of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he says, you Quraysh, you people have a reputation of prolonging payments. Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, give me my due. And he said, as I was harshly demanding my money from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I happened to glance at Umar who was next door. And I seen Umar's eyeballs were turning viciously. He looked at me and he said, Ya Adu Wallah, Atakulu li Rasulillahi ma asma. Am I hearing correct? Are you speaking to Allah's Nabi like this? How dare you blurt things like this? Bearing in mind, let's not forget, the time that was granted had not yet lapsed. This was a deliberate provocation from him, as the narration explains. The Prophet ﷺ did not argue the logistics that, you know what, my time has not ended, I still have a day. Nabi ﷺ said, Umar, Umar, that's not the way we deal with situations. You should have been more wise in your approach. Umar, you should have instructed me. Allah's Nabi is telling Umar, you should have instructed me and told me I must be more prompt with my payments. And you should have told Zayd ibn Su'na he should be more lenient in demanding his due. Umar, your approach is going to compound the problem. It's going to exacerbate the crisis. We're not moving forward. You should have told me, O oh Muhammad Sassim, be prompt with your payments. And you should have told Zayd ibn Sa'na should be more lenient when he demands his due. Now you take him, Umar, give him his due, and give him an added amount because of your harshness. Where is this character in the world? Can you imagine how the emotions of Umar were put to test? A man that's provoking you and inciting you, Allah's Nabi is telling you, be calm, be gentle, be polite. And that's not all, give him an added amount. Umar radiallahu said, I complied and I started walking. As we walk in, my blood is gushing and I am, you know what, furious and angry. How dare someone speaks to the Prophet like this. He said, Ata'rifuni ya Umar. Umar, do you know who I am? In my translation, Umar said, I don't know and I don't want to know. I don't know and I don't want to know. He said, Umar, I am Zayd ibn Su'na. Umar said, Al-Habr, the rabbi, the priest, the learned fellow. He said, yes, indeed. So Umar said, if you're such a learned man, you represent a faith, you shouldn't be speaking things like this and making such provocative sentiments. He said, Umar, let me tell you, I studied the biography of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and I closely monitored his moves. I was convinced beyond doubt he is the final messenger. I had reservation in two qualities. And I've actually come to test those two qualities. I read in the divine scriptures, Yasbuku Hilmuhu Jahlahu. 
ولا تزيد شدة الجهل عليه إلا حلما that his forbearance surpasses his anger and the more you aggravate him the more calm he becomes the more you incite him the more composed he becomes Umar I have put it to trial and I am convinced that he is the Nabi I don't want anything I make you my witness I am one of the most prominent people of Medina I proclaim the Kalima and half my wealth is in charity to Allah's Nabi and the cause of Islam Ushiduka anna shatra mali sadaqatan lil Islam I make you my witness that half of my wealth is a charity to Islam what did it take to convince this person into the beauty of Islam it was the forbearance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam there are so many incidents in this regard that elucidate and expound the very same theory Umair ibn Wahab let me share with you another narration this is a narration of Hakim a Sahabi by the name of Al-Qama radiyallahu anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was very impressed with his eloquence he was very articulate in speech Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked him who are you and where do you come from Al-Qama he said we are seven in the group and I am a Muslim and all those with me are equal Muslims so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam said لِكُلِّ قَوْلٍ حَقِيقًا فَمَا حَقِيقَةُ إِيمَانِكُمْ There is a proof to every claim. How do you substantiate your claim? And this is what I often say. Today we have created many symbols amongst ourselves by virtue of which we identify ourselves as Muslims. Allah hasn't endorsed these symbols as the reflection of Iman. I don't know here, but back home in South Africa, many people have the 786 which is symbolic to bismillahir rahmanir rahim so many people would keep a mobile number as 786 a number plate as 786 a phone number as 786 and they appease themselves that i have reflected something by virtue of which society identifies with me as a muslim I'm saying this is not the grounds of which identification will take place in the court of Allah. The Prophet says, what is the proof that you are a believer? He said, we have 15 qualities. Khamsun amartana biha. Khamsun amaratna biha rusuluk. Khamsun takhallakna biha fil jahiliyya. Wa nahnu alayha ila al-an illa antanhana ya Rasulullah. Five I heard direct from you. Five I heard from your messengers. And five were found in us from the very era of darkness. Unless you choose to prohibit us, we will then forsake it. But these were good qualities that were found in us from our ancient days and from our ancestry. We've inherited them. The Prophet ﷺ said and explained to me which are the five that you heard direct from me. He said, Amartana and Nu'mina Billahi, Wamala Ikatihi, Wakutubihi, Warusulihi, Walkadri Khairihi, Washarihi. You've instructed us to believe on Allah, His angels, the books, the prophets, and that good and bad fate comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wamal Khamsulati Amarat Kumbiha Rusuli, and what are the five that my messengers have commanded you? He said, Amaratna Rusuluk, and Nashhada Allah ilaha illallah, wa annaka abduhu wa rasulu. وَنُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةَ الْمَكْتُوبَةَ وَنُؤَدِّ الزَّكَاءَ وَنَصُومَ رَمَضَانَ وَنَحُجَّ الْبَيْتَ إِنْ إِسْتَطَعْنَا إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا We heard from your messengers that we should believe in the oneness of Allah, in your finality, observe the prayers, discharge the charity, and perform the five daily prayers. The Prophet ﷺ said, and what are those five that you had in you from the days of darkness? Now listen to these qualities. This was found in the pagan Arab even in the era of darkness he said ash-shukru inda ar-rakha wa sabru inda al-bala wa as-sidq fi mawatin al-liqa wa ar-rada bi murri al-qada 
وترك الشماتة بالمصيبة إذا حلت بالأعداء. Number one, we had this inherent in our teachings that we must be grateful in moments of prosperity. الشكر عند الرخاء والصبر عند البلاء. We must persevere and endure in moments of hardship and difficulty. والصدق في مواطن اللقاء. And we must be honest and transparent when we deal with Muslims or non-Muslims alike. Now there is an amazing incident in Bidaya wa Nihaya, which is the works of Ibn Kathir rahimahullah. He's made mention of the narration and I read it in detail. When Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiyallahu anhu was migrating from Makkah Mukarrama to Medina Munawwara, and his migration coincided with the expedition of Badr, which goes down as one of the most sacred campaigns in the annals of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Huzaifa radiyallahu anhu for the record, the confidant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his father Yaman radiyallahu anhu, both father and son are migrating from Mecca to Medina. On the way, they were intercepted by Abu Jahl, who was also mobilizing his people and going to battle in Badr with the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Jahl apprehends Huzaifa radiallahu anhu, and he says, no, we're not going to release you, because if we release you, you will go to Medina, join the Muslims, become reinforcement for them against us. So basically, we are contributing to our own destruction. Hence, we will not release you. Huzaifa ibn Yaman pleads to him and says, release us and we will not go and aid the Muslims and assist the Muslims. After much negotiation on the pretext, on the agreement that you will go to Medina, you will not participate in the campaign, I will release you. He said, it's a done deal. Huzaifa and his father Yaman radiallahu anhuma were released and they leave from Mecca. And when they get to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ is on the outskirts of Medina marching towards Badr. And with him are the Sahaba. So they come and they join. And they said, Oh Prophet of Allah, can we join you? He said, Yes. As they walk, walk in, Huzaifa radiallahu anhu said, Oh Prophet ﷺ, I would like, just like to mention to you for the record that as I was coming, I was apprehended by Abu Jahl. I was intercepted by Abu Jahl. And then after lengthy negotiations, he finally released me on the pretext that I will not assist you people in the battle. But I just said it to appease him. Abu Jahl is the arch enemy of Islam. Can I join you? Read the narration. The Prophet wasallam said, Huzaifa, you cannot join us. You gave Abu Jahl your word. You have to honor it. Abu Jahl, the most proud man in this ummah, the Fir'aun of this ummah, the man who had caused the greatest pain to the Prophet ﷺ. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to Huzaifa radiallahu anhu? No, no, no. You promised a disbeliever. You gave him a verbal contract. It's a binding contract. Honor your verbal commitments to whomsoever you make it. Whether it's Muhammad or Peter, Yusuf or Thomas, Ibrahim or John, Islam compels us that we honor our dealings when we deal in with fellow Muslims or fellow citizens or fellow humans. For the record, those who participated in Badr, the accolade, the merit, the privilege that they enjoy is so unique. Bukhari Sharif, second volume, Jibreel descends. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how do you view the participants of Badr? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we grade them as the best amongst us. So there is a Badri, a participant of Badr, and there is a non-participant 
the one who participated surpasses a non-participant by far. Jibreel said to the Prophet ﷺ, وَكَذَلِكَ مَنْ شَهِدَ بَدْرًا مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةً Just as the participant of Badr is more senior to the non-participant, in the very same breath and in the very same vein, the Malaika that descended to aid the Sahaba in Badr, those angels rank superior to other angels who did not descend in Badr. So this ranking is not only amongst the humans, this ranking is also amongst the Malaika. And Imam Bukhari has mentioned a Tarjumatul Bab, a chapter, that if you take the names of those who participated in Badr and you make dua, Allah will accept your dua. My point is, Huzaifa ibn Yaman was a giant, was a great Sahabi, was the confidant of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But I'm afraid he does not enjoy the accolade and he does not enjoy the merit of being a participant of Badr. Why? Because the word that he gave to Abu Jahl was binding. O oh, Muslim, understand, Muslim businessman, when you interact with the broader world, this is the time to exhibit. Exhibit the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالصِّدْقُ فِي مَوَاطِنِ اللِّقَاءِ Honesty. وَالتَّرْكِ الشَّمَاتَ بِالْمُصِيبَ إِذَا حَلَّتْ بِالْأَعْدَاءِ And what did Alqama radhi Allahu anhu say? What was the fifth quality that was found in us from the era of darkness? We never ever in our life rejoiced over the pain we never rejoiced over the pain of even our enemies. As, as, as Arabs, it was inherent in us. We never rejoiced on the pain of anyone, not even our enemies. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he was moved. We believe, and I said it in many a talks, for us, every life is precious. The life of a Muslim is precious. The life of a non-Muslim is precious. Human life is precious. Nay, today there are animal campaigns and people who speak about the rights of animals. Hassan radiallahu anhu passes a garden and an orchard and he finds a slave sitting there and he is busy feeding a dog and he's eating. And then the meal is left as a slice of bread. And the slave slices it in half. And he gives half the slice to the dog and half the slice of bread he eats himself. Hassan radiallahu anhu with a sense of morality, he was moved to tears. He said, oh young man, dark skin, he was a slave. He said, oh young man, what made you do what you did? You hungry, you poor, you need the food. Why did you split the bread in half and give half to the dog and ate half yourself? So this person said, I looked at hunger in the eyes of this dog and I couldn't, I couldn't for the sake of me eat while another creature next to me stares at me. I, I couldn't look. I couldn't look at an animal. I am saying, do we have those qualities? The Prophet ﷺ is walking. Safwan ibn Umayyah, a disbeliever. He looks at a flock of sheep that has covered a valley. And it belongs to the Prophet ﷺ. And he's admiring. He's green with envy. Wow, that's so impressive. The Prophet ﷺ sensed his envy. He said, Do you like what you see? He said, I love it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Then just don't love it in your thoughts. Have it. He said, what? You know, sometimes you read about these lottery winners, which is rather rare. When they win, many of them die with shock. Too good to be true. He said, what? 
the Prophet said, you can take all this. Do I have that generous heart? He took the flock of sheep, one quality of generosity. He went to his nation, who were disbelievers. Ya qawm aslimu, fa wallahi inna muhammadan la yu'ti ata'an ma yakhafu al-faqr. Oh my nation, I have embraced the faith. And I exhort you to embrace the faith. By Allah, this man has not come to take your money. He has come to give you his money. By Allah, this man has not come to take. This quality of generosity brings Safwan into Islam and his whole tribe. Hassan radiallahu is moved by the generosity of this man. He said, Ghulamu man, whose slave are you? He said, Aban ibn Uthman. Well, Ha'it and this orchard belongs to my master. He said, you sit here. These were people who had sentiments in them. These were people who had morality in them. He goes to Aban. He said, tell me, are you the master of so and so? He said, yes. That orchard belongs to you. He said, yes. Tell me, how much are you selling the slave and the, master, the, the, the orchard for? He said, an X amount. Hassan radiallahu gave him the price immediately. He returned back to that slave. He said, your generosity has impressed me so much. I have purchased you from your master and by Allah I have liberated you. And this orchard is a gift to you. Who will then not embrace the faith? When the Prophet sallallahu heard these qualities from Al-Qama radiallahu anhu, what did he say? He said, Fuqaha Udaba Kadu an Yakunu Ambiya Min Khisalin Ma Ashrafaha. These are the jurists of my Ummah. These are the authorities of my Ummah. They possess the traits and the qualities of the Prophets. And then the Prophet gave a broad smile. He said, You have 15 qualities. Let me give you another five to complement it. And you take this 20, and then you have the good of both the worlds. لا تجمعوا ما لا تأكلون. Don't gather food which you will never love to eat. ولا تبنوا ما لا تسكنون. And don't build dwellings in which you will never love. ولا تنافسوا فيما غدا عنه تزولون. And do not compete and vie with one another in things you will leave tomorrow. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ And fear that Allah to whom is your return. وَارْغَبُوا فِي مَا إِلَيْهِ تَسِيرُونَ And incline in the preparation of that day wherein you are going to dwell with eternity. The narration appears in Sirat Mustafa. One of the non-Muslim captives of Badr said, when the disbelievers were captured in Badr, the Prophet said, Istawsu bil usara khaira. One, one proclamation. Be kind when dealing with the captives. He said, I literally seen as a captive, I ate better food than my master. I was the prisoner, I was the captive. My master ate one meal, I ate two. So I said, you know what? It looks like you the slave and I'm the master. Why, why this? He said, my Nabi has given me directions. I must deal gently with the disbelievers and in particular with the captives. So you will eat more than me and you will eat better than me. Umair ibn Wahab and Safwan ibn Umayyah were sitting in the haram. And they were discussing the challenges that were facing the Quraysh post Badr. Badr was a blow to them. Badr was a defeat. Badr was a fall. And they lost some very prominent high profile people, the likes of Abu Jahl and others. So Safwan ibn Umayyah and Umair ibn Wahab were sitting in the Haram Sharif and they were discussing this year. How can we empower ourselves? How can we mobilize ourselves? So Safwan ibn Umayyah said, Wallahi ma fil aishi ba'dahum khair. Since we lost these people, there's no more pleasure living, living. In, there's, there's no more pleasure in life. Umair ibn Wahab said this. So Safwan ibn Umayyah said to him, 
والله لولا دين علي وعيال عندي أخشى عليهم الضيعة لركبت إلى محمد حتى أقتله You quite right If it wasn't for my wife and children which is my obstacle and the debts that I have I would have gone beheaded, executed and assassinated Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now and now. So Umair ibn Wahab said, if the only obstacle is to attend to your family and your debts, then I'll take care of your family, iyaluka ma'a iyali, and I will settle your debts. Go and kill this man and put an end to Islam. So anyway, Umair got ready. He prepared his sword. Safwan said, I'll take care of your family. And he leaves. He leaves Mecca with the evil intention to come and assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. And I will explain to you, this is only the Prophet ﷺ and his character who converted his would-be assassins into his devout companions. Who converted his would-be assassins into devout companions. Is there anybody else is there any other reformer in human history who has achieved this? It's the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, Umar ibn Wahab comes with his sword camouflaged. The Sahaba was sitting in Masjid al Nabawi and they were cherishing their success in Badr. These people were discussing their failure. The Muslims were rejoicing over their success. So, Umar radiallahu looked and he said Umar ibn Wahab at the door. Umar sensed with his inner eye, the man has come with ulterior motives. He's not clean in his intention. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, Umar ibn Wahab is here. Wallahi ma jaa illa li sharrin. I can read his forelock and tell you he's come with an evil agenda. Be wary. Anyway, Umar goes to him, grabs him harshly, and ushers him. Nabi Sallallahu said, Umar, leave him. Be polite with him. Be gentle with him. Be courteous with him. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam afforded him the common courtesy, welcomed him into Masjid and Nabawi. He then greeted in Abu Sabaha, which was the traditional Arab greeting, which would equate good morning. It was morning, it would equate, uh, 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 you know, a close translation would be good morning. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, قَدْ أَنْعَمَنَ, قد أنعمنا اللَّهُ بِتَحِيَّةٍ هِيَ خَيْرًا مِّن تَحِيَّتِكُمْ وَهِيَ تَحِيَّةُ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ As Muslims, Allah has honored us with a very profound and a very rich greeting and a very wholesome greeting. We salute and greet by saying, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Anyway, they got chatting. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Umair, what brings you here to leave your family and come all the way to Medina? He said, my son has been captured by you people and I have come with the sole intention to negotiate the release of my son. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, okay, that's fine. If you've come to negotiate the release of your son, what makes you bring a sword and weapons? He said, no, no, a sword is just... Uh, a, a symbol of protection and self-defense. It doesn't indicate war or resistance or fighting in any way. Nabi Sallallahu said, as sadaqta ya Umair. Umair, you want to tell me the truth and be honest? He said, I swear to God the Great. I have no other objectives. Nabi Sallallahu then looked at him and said, Umair, just rewind. You and Safwan were sitting in the haram. Safwan said, there's no more pleasure after Abu Jahl died. Then you said, if it wasn't for your wife and children, you would have killed me. Then Safwan said, he'll take care of your wife and settle your debts. And you have come with this sword to kill me. He stood up and he said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Hadha amrun lam yahdurhu illa ana wa Safwan. By Allah, this was a private, discreet gathering between me and him. There was no third influence there. A divine being has informed you and that is Allah. I have openly embraced the faith. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Faqihu akhakum, take your brother and now introduce him to Islam. Soon he was given the teachings of Islam and he became rich into Islam. He said, Wallahi la ada'u makanan jalastu fihi bil kufri illa ajlis fihi bil iman. I will not leave any land on which I had walked as a disbeliever. 
nor will I leave any land on which I sat as a disbeliever, but that I want to sit on that land and walk on that land as a believer now. So that if this earth was to testify against me that a sinner, a transgressor walked here, I'm optimistic from Allah. The evidence will now be turned positive in my favor that a companion of Muhammad وسلم, has walked on my back. I'm saying, what was the character of Muhammad Thumama was captured. He was brought into Masjid al Nabawi. He was tied to one of the pillars. Nabi Sallallahu prayed the Fajr Salah, walked out, looked at him and he said, Ma indaka ya Thumama. Thumama, what do you have to offer? What's your take? What's up? He said, In taqtul taqtul dha damin wa in tun'im tun'im ala shakir. Oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you choose to execute me, my blood will not go cheap. My nation will avenge my death. They will be a bloody warrior, they will be a skirmish. Nabi Alayhi left him and went. The next day he passes by, he was tied to one of the pillars in the courtyard. Thumama, any change of intention, he said, I hold my sentiments. I said to you yesterday, I repeat it. If you negotiate a release, then you will be releasing a man who will remember your favors. And if you choose to kill, then my blood will not go free. Nabi alayhi salam said, Atliqu Thumama. Oh, my Sahaba, release Thumama, release him. They released Thumama radiallahu anhu. He goes to a close by well in Medina Munawwara. He takes a bath and he comes back. He said, By Allah, three days ago when they tied me to the spiller, I hated you the most. And by Allah, before the third day the sun could set, I love you the most. And I want to embrace your faith. And he embraces the faith and he takes the kalima. I'm saying this was the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the occasion of Badr, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uncle, Abbas radiallahu anhu, was not a Muslim at that time. He was captured. The Ansar had captured him. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a restless night because of his uncle. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam said to Umar in the morning, Inni lam anam al-layla li ajli ammi al-Abbas. The entire night I have not slept because of my uncle Abbas. So Umar radiallahu said, should I go to the Ansar and ask them to release him? Now bearing in mind, he was not a Muslim, he was captured. Later he embraced Islam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi said, that will be great. That will be great if you could perhaps go and, you know, negotiate this release. So anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu goes to the Ansar and says, you people have captured Nabi Sallallahu uncle. Would you people be kind enough to release him? They said, no, he's a captive, he's a non-Muslim, he's a, uh, you know, warrior of the war, we've captured him. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, فَإِنْ كَانَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ رِضًا If I tell you Allah's Nabi's happiness lies in releasing him, they said, then don't negotiate, take him and go. Take him and go, what's there to ask? Anyway, Abbas was brought and he was taken. He was a captive, his condition was not very good. In his physique and in his structure, he was very muscular. He was huge in size. He didn't have clothes, he wasn't well clad. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gently just passed his gaze around to see if anybody has an added cloth to give to his uncle. So the Sahaba were very willfully and they were very happy to offer. But unfortunately, none of them in their size were of the stature of Abbas radiallahu anhu. So none of them had anything. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, the leader of the Munafiqeen, he was massive in structure. He said, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you want, I will offer my shirt and I will give it to your uncle. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will appreciate that and it will mean a lot to me. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the shirt of the leader of the Munafiqeen, gave it to his uncle Abbas radiallahu anhuma. If you want to read the academic discussion of this, it appears in the tafsir in the 10th juz in Surah Tawbah. خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَىٰ وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ إِنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ There's a great write-up there, it appears there. In Ma'riful Quran in particular, that's where I found my point of reference. Anyway, he was clad with this particular shirt and for the moment his needs were attended to. 
Years later, Abdullah bin Ubay had caused enormous pain to the Prophet ﷺ. When I say enormous pain, beyond imagination. But his son Abdullah was a devout Sahabi. The father was the instigator, the key runner of the entire Munafiq movement. And the reason of his movement was prior to the coming of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina, the people of Medina wanted to crown him as the leader. And just then the Prophet ﷺ came. When he came, all focus went on the Prophet ﷺ. So he lost his position. When he lost his position, then he started working from inside. And he created this inside movement. In English they say, I love people who openly hate me. I love people who openly hate me, but I hate people who pretend to love me. I love people who openly hate me. If a man openly says he hates me, I understand he's transparent, but I hate people who pretend to love me. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul were amongst those who pretended to love the Prophet When he passed away, his son Abdullah radiallahu anhu came, and he said, O Prophet of Allah, my father has died. He was a munafiq. He, the Quran says the worst torment is for the munafiq. So anyway, he said, O Prophet of Allah, my father has passed away. Would you be kind enough to give us your garb? The Prophet ﷺ took out his blessed thawb, his blessed garb, and he gave it to Abdullah radiallahu anhu as a coffin to wrap the body of the leader of the munafiqeen. Scholars have given a detailed academic debate to the extent Umar even objected, Oh Nabi of Allah, but he's a munafiq, what are you doing? Nabi alayhi salam said, Umar, leave me to do what I feel is correct. It's a long story. In the tafsir it is mentioned, the vision of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam to Abdullah was that this man, this disbeliever, was kind to my uncle Abbas on the occasion of Badr. And he had given his piece of cloth. Now that he has died, I wanted to offset his favor. I wanted to acknowledge him that a disbeliever had displayed this kindness to me for on behalf of my uncle. Hence, in lieu of this, to reciprocate his good, I have given my blessed garb. And furthermore, he said, I am optimistic. My gesture will make inroads for the people of his tribe to be attracted to the beauty of Islam. And it's written in Ma'arif al-Quran on this gesture of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he gave his blessed garb to be the coffin of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. Looking at this act alone, 1,000 people accepted Islam. 1,000 people accepted Islam. So it is, the, it is the element of character amongst the people with whom the Prophet ﷺ had showed phenomenal tolerance. Habbar bin Aswad, when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina Munawwara and then he made arrangements, he made arrangements for his family to be brought to Medina. And he asked his daughter Zainab, who was his eldest daughter, to come to Medina as well. She was pregnant while she left Mecca on the back of a camel and she was coming to Medina. As she left Mecca and she was going, the disbelievers spotted her. And they said, isn't that the daughter of Muhammad? How can we leave her and don't harass her? Advance towards her. So Ab Habbar bin Aswad advanced with a spear and a dagger and he pierced it into the camel causing the camel to collapse and Zainab radiallahu anha to fall and it proved to be so fatal that her child was aborted. Her child which was the grandchild of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was aborted. 
Her condition was not stable to resume her journey. She was returned back to Mecca and stabilized. And when she was somehow stabilized, she was then brought to Medina. But for the record, and I'm not going into the detail, I want to show you the character of Nabi alayhi salam to fellow non-Muslims. This very injury that she sustained in the journey of Hijra proved to be fatal and ultimately claimed her life in Medina as a result of this very same injury. It lived on with her, it was nursed, it was treated, uh, but, the, but she never recovered. She never recovered, it continued. When the Prophet ﷺ had conquered Mecca and he had given general amnesty and general pardon, but then he said few people will be executed due to their horrendous crime and their evil doings, Amongst them, he said, is the murderer of my daughter, Habbar bin Aswad. And there can be no two opinions on the, on the legitimacy and the justification to execute the murderer of your daughter. There can be no two opinions on this. The Prophet ﷺ said, general amnesty, but there were few people. And amongst them is Habbar bin Aswad due to the pain he has caused me. My grandchild passed away as a result and ultimately it claimed the life of my own daughter. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ issued this decree that wherever you see him, nab him, behead him and end him because he has killed my daughter. And the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in Makkah Mukarramah, this was after the conquest. While he was sitting with the Sahaba, Habbar bin Aswad walks into the masjid and he had covered himself. Sahaba said, Oh Nabi of Allah, here's the murderer of your daughter Habbar. They unsheathed their swords. Can you imagine what must have happened to a man like Omar? Can you possibly endeavor to imagine what must have been the emotions in the life of Omar, who often would react to much more simpler situations? Oh Nabi of Allah, here's he coming. Nabi alayhi salam said, Allow him the courtesy to enter and give him an opportunity to speak. Allow him the courtesy. Who? The murderer of my daughter. Who? The murderer of my daughter. He walks in. The narration is very long. It appears in Sirat al Mustafa. He said, Oh Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I don't have a face to look at you. I guess my very presence will refresh the memories of your daughter. I guess my very existence will open up a very dull chapter. You have rightly issued the command of my execution. And I was on the verge of fleeing. But then someone whispered in my ears that you're a man of phenomenal patience and tolerance. To the extent that you'll even give amnesty to the murderer of your daughter. وَقَدْ سَمِعْتُ صِلَتَكَ وَرَحِمَكَ I heard of your profound caliber and I have come here and I am begging to kindly overlook my mistake. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said I have forgiven you unconditionally and he then looked at the Sahaba and said, nobody should harass him because of his evil. I have forgiven him for what he has done. He openly proclaimed the kalima in the midst of the Sahaba. When Ikrama, the son of Abu Jahl, was coming and Nabi wasallam was informed, he said to the Sahaba, Ya'tikum ikramatu mu'minan. يَأْتِيكُمْ عِكْرَمَةُ مُؤْمِنًا فَلَا تَسُبُّوا أَبَاهُ فَإِنَّ سَبَّ الْمَيِّتِ يُؤْذِ الْحَيِّ وَلَا يَبْلُغُ الْمَيِّتِ Listen, oh my sahaba, Ikrama, the son of Abu Jahl, will be coming shortly. When he comes, don't taunt him because of the evil of his late father Abu Jahl. Don't incite him, offend him, insult him because of the wrong of his father. Why? Because abusing the deceased offends the living and does not harm the dead. Because abusing the deceased offends the living. So Ikrama walks in. It's not like, oh, here's Abu Jahl's son. 
your father no nabi sallallahu had put restraint on the sahaba he walks in nabi alayhi salam stands up to greet him the son of abu jahal the man who had caused all the pain to nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam he then embraces islam in that gathering the narration goes on to say nabi alayhi salam made dua for him allahumma ighfir lahu kulla adawatin adaniha allahumma ighfir lahu kulla adawatin adaniha wa kulla masirin sara fihi ila mawdi'in yuridu bi dhalika almasir itfa'a nurik wa ighfir lahu ma nala minni min 'ird fi wajhi aw ana ghaibun anhu aw la ya yuzakrama the son of abu jahal you have given him islam it is my dua forgive him for every nasty comment he has made against me or islam allah every step that he has taken in the path of evil forgive me and allah forgive him for insulting me in my presence or in my absence ikrama said i burst into tears i said oh muhammad what a man you are i have only embraced the faith and you showering me with such prayers it boils down to the key component of character i often say i often say as muslims we have to become ambassadors of this faith and if for whatever reason we cannot become ambassadors for allah's sake don't become obstacles to the faith if we cannot become ambassadors don't become obstacles don't give off the wrong notion Remember my brother when you traveling you interacting you are one individual representing the broader Islam more so in a hostile climate where journalism often chooses to be biased and makes one muslim's actions a reflection of Islam in its entirety all the more we need to be conscious of the implications of our actions Am I not soiling the name of Islam? Am I not tarnishing the reputation of the Muslims? Umm Salma radhiyallahu anha, what a great woman. The incident is very long. I want to share one portion of it. She says, when I decided to leave Mecca, and as we were exiting from Mecca, my people came myself my husband and my son so my tribe came to my husband and they said you want to go you can go but you will not take our daughter that's your wife thumma wathabu alayhi intizaan and then they came and they abducted me and they told my husband you can go and they pulled me aside anyway i was left one side and my husband had to go when my husband's tribe seen this they came and they said now that you've separated the man from this woman that child represents our tribe we won't leave the child with the mother so they came to abduct my child and my tribe say no it is our child thumma tafiqu yatajadhabuna ibni bainahum my husband is gone i'm on the outskirts of makkah my tribe and my husband's tribe both are actually pulling my child literally in front of me until they dislodged his whole arm and they took him fafi sa'atin furriqtu bayni wa bayna zawji wa bayna ibni in a matter of a minute my life was turned we were living as a happy family migrating to medina and in a minute the whole thing turned and we see it sometimes it's an accident sometimes it's a tragedy in a second your life can change forever one tragedy in the family and the life is never the same anyway they separated me from my husband and my child was taken one side and my son was kept away from me for one entire year baqitu ala dhalika sanatan one entire year after one year some people pitied my condition and they said ala tutliquna hadhihi al asira ala tutliquna hadhihi al asira why don't you people release this poor woman man you've separated her from her husband you've separated her from a child pity her and release her 
So anyway, finally they said, okay, you can go. But she said, how can I go when I don't have my child? So someone then interceded on behalf of my husband's tribe and they returned my child to me. After one year, I'm seeing my child and the last moments and memories of my child was his arm was dislodged. A good year passes, no communication. Lam an fi Makkah. I hasten, I take my son on my lap. Wada'atu waladi fi hijri. I put my son on my lap and I leave Makkah Mukarrama. Wa ma in balaghtu tan'im. I barely reached tan'im. Hatta laqeetu Uthman ibn Talha. I met Uthman ibn Talha. Uthman ibn Talha was not a Muslim at that time. I'm saying character. Uthman ibn Talha came to me and he said to me, Ila ayn ya bint Zad al-Rakib? Oh, Umm Salma, where are you off to? I said, Uridu Zawji bil Medina. I want my husband in Medina. So he said to me, Ma ma'aki ahadun? You don't have anyone with you, sister? I said, Ma ma'i ahadun illa Allah wa bunayya hadha. I have no one but Allah and my little baby. So Uthman ibn Talha said, By Allah, you are not alone. I am going to escort you from here right into Medina. And he said, she says, he then accompanied me. Now we know the journey from Mecca to Medina on camelback is a good few weeks. The desert, the, the, the mountainous terrain, the heat, etc. Umm Salma radiallahu anha said, I had met many people in my life. I had met many men in my life. This was the first human I met. Listen to this. And this is food for thought for every one of us here, in particular the men. She said, by Allah, from Makkah to Medina, we travel for weeks. This man never set his gaze on me once. This man never set his gaze on me once. You think, no, because you're traveling in a flight and there's a woman next to you and it's a 10-hour flight, so you're a victim of circumstances. And might be a pleasant victim. And at the same time, he was not hostile. He was not hostile. She says, whenever it would be time to halt, he would hold the reins, he would set the camel down, anni, he would move to the rear, hatta idha nazaltu an dhahrihi, when I would dismount, iqtadahu ila shajaratin wa qayyadahu biha. He would take the reins, he would then tie it to a tree, and then he would move away. I would sit under a tree with my baby, he would sit and rest there. When it would be time to resume, he would bring the animal, sit it down next to me, move aside again. She said, diligently, religiously, I watched this man, he never looked at me once. I would mount on, he would grab the reins, walk in front, and this practice continued. وَمَا زَالَ يَسْنَعُ ذَلِكَ he continued doing this year until we reached Medina Munawwara. When we got to Medina, he said, Zawjuki fi hadhihi al-qarya. Udkhuliha ala barakatillah. O sister, your husband is in this locality. You can enter with the permission of Allah and with the help of Allah. He didn't wait for an acknowledgement. He didn't wait for a praise. He didn't wait for any monetary remuneration. He displayed this character and he went away. You think an action like this will go unrewarded in the eyes of Allah? You know, with your camera and my camera and your surveillance and my surveillance and your technology and my technology, sometimes there's a power outage and then it's gone. But the eye of Allah is always watching. This very act of his, Allah brought that day that he was favored with Islam. And at the conquest of Makkah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him and said, Uthman, I am entrusting the key of the Kaaba to you. It will stay with you while you are alive and it will remain in your progeny till Qiyamah. Till today, the key of the Kaaba remains in the descendants of Uthman. Uthman ibn Talha. What? It was this element of character. What did the Prophet tell Hakim ibn Hizam? 
Hakim ibn Hizam was a very, very generous person. Even in his days before Islam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Aslamta ala ma aslafta min khayrin. Your generosity as a non-Muslim brought you into the fold of Islam. So our topic, and I'm, 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 I'm speaking around it, much has been said. The key point that I'm harping around, for our key existence, it is character that we have to display. What did Imam Shafi rahmatullahi say? قَدْ مَاتَ قَوْمٌ وَمَا مَاتَتْ مَكَارِمُهُمْ وَعَاشَ قَوْمٌ وَهُمْ فِي النَّاسِ أَمْوَاتُ Many people have died a physical death, but their character has kept them alive. While others are physically alive, but their evil has killed them before they physically die. What did Imam Shafi rahmatullahi say? قَدْ مَاتَ قَوْمٌ Many people have physically died. وَمَا مَاتَتْ مَكَارِمُهُمْ But their character lives with us. It has kept them alive. And other people are physically alive. But their evil has killed them before they physically die. The choice is yours, my brother. Do you want to live after your physical death? Or do you want people hoping your death while you are alive? Abdullah ibn Mubarak had a non-Muslim neighbor. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahmatullah had a non-Muslim neighbor. So he sold his house. He put it on the market. He asked an exorbitant amount. Double the going rate. People said to him, how do you justify this amount? He said, half the money is for the house and the other half of the money is for the privilege of being the neighbor of Abdullah bin Mubarak. Non-Muslim neighbor selling his house. Today, unfortunately, if he sells because of us, maybe he'll lose value. Why? Because we, we haven't given any character. When Abdullah ibn Mubarak heard this, he was so humbled he went to his non-Muslim neighbor. He said, that was a very amazing gesture on your part. Could I perhaps invite you towards Islam? He said, oh, Abdullah, your character made me embrace Islam the day you moved next door. Your character has made me a Muslim the day you moved next door. So let us do some soul searching, some serious introspection in terms of how do we carry ourselves? How do we conduct ourselves? In terms of our dealings, what did the Prophet wasallam say? He said, a person who dies while acquiring the sciences of Islam is one below the prophets. A person who dies while acquiring the sciences of Islam is one below the prophets. But when it came to an honest tradesman, who fears Allah in his business, who's honest with his clients. At-tajiru sadduq ma'an nabiyyin. He said the honest tradesman when he dies, he's not below the prophets, he's with the prophets. He's with the prophets. If I've given someone my word, al-idatu daynun. Whoever I am dealing with, I have to be honest with him. There were some people that used to come to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were very, very harsh to him. And they used to speak to him with a forked tongue. They used to manipulate their words. They used to come and say, Assamu alayk, Assamu alayk. Wa idha jauka hayyawka bima lam yuhayyika bihi allahu wa yaquluna fi anfusihim lawla yuazzibuna allahu bima naqul. When they come to you, Muhammad وسلم, they greet you contrary to the greetings that Allah has invoked upon you. And they say that if he was a prophet, something would have happened to us. He's not a prophet because nothing happens to us. So they would come say, Assamu alayk, which means may death come upon you. Aisha used to be very annoyed 
and she one day said may death may curse may destruction may ruination be upon you Nabi alayhi salam said Aisha Aisha don't you realize Allah loves gentleness on all occasions oh Nabi of Allah but look at the audacity and the provocation Nabi alayhi salam said but didn't you see my polite re reply I said wa alayk which essentially means whatever you are invoking upon me may the same be upon you whatever you are invoking upon me may the very same be upon you if you look at the commentary of this verse which I recited in the opening the circumstances that prompted this revelation it's a verse of the 15 Jews of Surah Bani Israel in this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to my servants, they must be polite in their speech when speaking to non-Muslims. The reason that, it, to, to, to my servants, but if you look at the background of this verse, Umar radiallahu anhu had an argument with a non-Muslim. And in the interim, the voices were raised. And it became a bit ugly and loud. And there was a verbal altercation and a verbal skirmish. And Allah revealed the verses. And the scholars say that these verses are exhorting us categorically to be polite in speech when speaking to non-Muslims. This is the beauty of Islam. I often say in interfaith dialogues, while many accuse us to be narrow-minded, and many say we are not tolerant, our faith is the most far-reaching. A Christian is a Christian if he believes in the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. He does not have to believe in the Prophet ﷺ to be accepted as a member of his faith. And so it applies across the board. As Muslims, I am not a Muslim till I don't believe in Isa as a Prophet of Allah. I, I'm not saying in Muhammad Sassam, if I don't believe in Isa as the Prophet of Allah, I'm not a Muslim. If I don't believe in Musa as a prophet of Allah, I am not a Muslim. If I don't believe in the Torah and the Bible in its original unadulterated form, I am not a Muslim. This is the encompassing teachings of Islam. So it boils down to this common principle, this common principle of character. And see throughout the times and the ages how non-Muslims lived within our lands Umar radiallahu passes by a non-muslim who used to pay the indemnity taxes so non-muslims that lived within the muslim empire had to pay indemnity taxes by virtue of which they enjoyed all the privileges they were given freedom of religion and they were given freedom of, of their culture Umar radiallahu passed by a non-Muslim who was begging. Umar radiallahu looked at him and said, Ma ansafnaak. Ma ansafnaak. As Muslims we are guilty, we have given you a raw deal. Umar radiallahu looks at this non-Muslim and says, As Muslims we are guilty, we have given you a raw deal. Akhadna minkal jizya fi shababatik. We took taxes from you in your youth and your prime. And now you're dependent and you are liable in your old age. He then said to him, you will sit at home and our treasury will take care of your needs till you die. These were the teachings of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu is crossing the borders from Syria. He met an elderly woman on the borders. So Umar radiallahu anhu asked her, do you know Umar? She said, I don't know him, I've heard about him, but may Allah destroy him. I've heard about him, but may Allah destroy him. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, but sister, what, what has Umar done you wrong? How has he defaulted you? If he claims to be a Muslim, and he claims to be the leader, he must take care of the citizens. So she, he said to her, he was obviously, you know, plain on behalf. She didn't know she was talking to Umar. Umar is sitting in the capital, in the seat in Medina. How does Umar know what's happening on the borders of Syria? She said, well, if he doesn't keep himself abreast of developments and he doesn't keep himself up to speed with happenings, then he must dismount from his post. He mustn't take the post. 
because the post entails this I'm saying my brother Allah has given us this deen it is a wholesome deen it's an embracing deen a comment I have heard from many a reverts it makes me cry I by my nature I'm always intrigued to sit with reverts and find out what prompted them to Islam so that I can cherish what I have and I have in my humble travels met many non-muslim and I always enjoy it what tempted you what inspired you what motivated you and many reverts have told me this and it has made me cry and I leave you with these words he said to me I am grateful to the Almighty that I met Islam before meeting the Muslims what did this non-muslim revert say to me I am grateful to the Almighty I met Islam I read Islam before I met the Muslims he went on to say if my first interaction would have been the Muslims I doubt I would have embraced the faith but I'm grateful to Allah he led me to the pristine faith he introduced me to the divine religion hence when I seen the Muslim I realized he does not reflect the true Islam now how true yet how painful that's a sword piercing through our hearts that we have defaulted in terms of reflecting our character as neighbors as businessmen as fellow humans as fellow citizens as fellow creatures sharing a common planet on this earth may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and the ability that we become exemplary Muslims and we reflect Islam you know I know much time has been taken I just want to share a, a thought comes to my mind and, and, and this is something perhaps it might be important that I conclude on when you study the journey of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina this was not a journey when he was inviting people understand this point that I'm saying this was not a journey he was inviting people he left under very very secret conditions because there was a warrant against him so in a very camouflage way in the dead of night in the cover of dark disguising himself yet whoever he met they just started accepting Islam now what's my point you're going to China for business you're going somewhere else for a holiday your character is supposed to be such whether you are in France for business or in Dubai for a holiday whoever comes close to you have to be attracted to this magnet so the Prophet ﷺ is going and Suraqa who heard that the disbelievers had put the price of 100 camels for the head of Nabi alayhi salam he said when I heard this I was so tempted I said if I can get this deal 100 camels it will take care of my whole family so somebody came and said hey you know what I seen Muhammad going that way in a horseman that's him I said no no cannot be him and I deliberately played it down because I didn't want this man to pursue I said I want to go for it so I said no it can never be Muhammad anyway when that man left I told my slave girl take my horse and meet me outside Makkah I want to go I mounted onto my horse and I started galloping it at its pace and Nabi alayhi salam Abu Bakr Amir ibn Fuhaira Abdullah ibn Ariqat one was the guide and with them these sahaba were traveling in the dead of night they're taking shelter and moving and Nabi alayhi salam says Suraqa coming at the rear so Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam just turned his blessed gaze and he looked at Suraqa and the earth split and his horse started sinking he realized this was the effect of the eye of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam. he said oh Muhammad forgive me a man who wants to intercept you how are you going to forgive him oh Muhammad forgive me Nabi alayhi salam said okay I have forgiven you his horse comes back to the earth but you know the temptation of evil unfortunately I am I am guilty of it and so are you my brother you got involved in an illicit relation you burnt your fingers you messed your marriage you made Toba and a week pass and again the very urge comes in and you find you succumb to that same evil you burnt your hands Suraka said okay I'm gonna leave 
But then he said, 100 camels, man, I can't leave this. 100 camels, winners know when to stop. So he said, let me try again. So he puts chains again behind Nabi alayhi salam. And he comes advancing, Nabi alayhi salam turns his gaze and it drops and it sinks. Oh Muhammad, forgive me. Nabi alayhi salam smiles and he says, okay, Suraka, I have forgiven you. Unconditionally, the man who wants to intercept him for the sake of 100 camels. I have forgiven you. This happens for the third time he's tempted. And he does it the same. And his horse starts sinking. Then he realizes, you know what? Leave the hundred camels, I'll lose this one horse also. The hundred camels, that's, that's a long vision. This one horse is also going to go. He said, oh Muhammad, hands up, hands up. Can I come close to your honor, hug you and embrace your faith? Hands up, I'm not coming to kill you, I cannot, I'm convinced. Nabi alayhi salam said, okay, come. They stopped in the journey of hijrat on a very peculiar, uncommon road because the intelligence was against Nabi alayhi salam. They stopped. He meets Nabi alayhi salatu was salam and said, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi write that you have given me amnesty and protection. Nabi alayhi salam writes, tells Amir ibn Fuhaira, whatever was available, who was the scribe, right, we've given him peace. He offers to Nabi alayhi salatu was salam whatever food he had for the remaining part of the journey. Nabi alayhi salam said, no, that's fine. We are taken care of in terms of our food. But one thing you can do is, if anybody is trying to locate us and put in a chase behind us, then just, uh, you know what, move them away from us. He said, I will do this. Embraces the faith. Embraces the faith. Coming for 100 camels, leaves as a Muslim. Leaves as a Muslim. Comes back, goes to who? Abu Jahal. Aba Hakmin, wallahi law kunta shahida li amri jawadi idh tasukhu qawaimu. Abu Jahal, come I tell you, nobody knows quietly in the dead of night I went. I thought I'll get the hundred camels, I'll give you some, but leave the hundred camels and that. I promise you, I tried three times. The man just looked a gentle gaze and I went down in the ground. By Allah, he forgave me on every instance. I was moved to tears and humbled by his apology. I have accepted the faith. I hereby invite you also to the faith. At least you regret on the day of Qiyamah. They go from there. They come to the house of Umm Ma'bad. My, my point here is, this was not a dedicated journey of inviting. These were by the way developments that was happening. Nabi Sassam didn't call Suraka. You're not going in the path of Allah. You are going on travel. But your character ought to be such, whoever comes close to you must be attracted. You sit in a plane, the man must feel the presence of Iman. You walk into your client's place, you walk into a business venture, you sit down, you take Allah's name, you conduct yourself with ethics and morals, the man comes and asks you, what is the beauty of Islam? Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha, Nabi Sassim goes to the house of Umm Ma'bad. They were very hungry on this journey, the food were exhausted, the provisions were depleted. Nabi Sassim said, oh Umm Ma'bad, could you give us some milk from your goats? She said, I don't have. Nabi Sassam said, there's a goat in the rear there. Can I take that goat? She said, here, that goat is on the verge of death. You're not going to get anything out of it. Nabi Sassam said, okay, if you just give me consent, how to milk it, that I'll do. You just allow me. She said, go for it. You're going to, it's a futile exercise, but it's your luck. Nabi Ali Sassam sat down, read Bismillah, gently stroked the other, and the vessel was brimming. Umm Ma'bad said, I started looking like, is this my goat? When did this happen and how did this happen? Fill the vessel, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first gave it to Umm Ma'bad, gave it to her. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi filled another vessel, he drank, gave all the companions, everyone. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this and he left. The husband returns in the evening. Oh my wife, where's this milk and where's this? This goat from its udders, so much milk and all this. How did this happen? So she said, there have been some strangers making their way from Makkah to Medina. And they stop here. This is what happened. So the husband said, this looks like the very Qureshi man. The Qureshi prophet. I'm telling you, this is him. If these are his blessings, what's the delay? Let's embrace the faith. So Umm Ma'bad and her husband both embrace Islam. Umm Ma'bad and her husband both embrace Islam. And Allah Masuyuti has made mention of the Arabic couplets which are phenomenal, it's time consuming. 
جزا الله رب الناس خير جزائه الرفيقين حلا خيمتي ام معبد هما نزلاها بالهدى فاهتدت به فقد فاز من امسى الرفيق محمد ليهني ابا بكر سعاده جده بصحبته من يسعد الله يسعد ليهني بني كعب مقام فتاتهم ومقعدها للمؤمنين بمرصد سلوا اختكم عن شاتكم وانائها فانكم ان تسالوا الشات تشهدي amazing couplets but one particular thing that i would like to highlight a poet said this year describing this whole tale of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam's profound impact on this couple and how they embrace islam the poet goes on to say go ask this woman about the character of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how she reverted to islam and the poet goes on to say if you get to the house and umm maabud is not there then you can ask the goat the goat will tell you who muhammad was سلوا اختكم عن شاتكم وانائها فانكم ان تسالوا الشات تشهد one more incident and i'll wrap up they move ahead from the burayda aslami comes i'm sharing with you three incidents in the journey of hijrat these were people who had their own agendas they accept in islam burayda aslami comes with 70 people and they ambush nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam nabi sallallahu is very calm and relaxed Initially, he had some bodyguards around him. Allah revealed the verse, Ya ayyuhar rasoolu ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik wa illam taf'al fama ballagta risalata wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas Allah will protect you from the people. He then released them of their duties and he said, Allah said, he'll take care of me so I don't need anyone around me. Anyway, Burayda Aslami comes with 70 people to ambush Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They come in very close to Medina. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mustafa has the narration. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Who are you? He said, Burayda Aslami. Now, if you study the life of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was one who would deduce good omens. In Islam, there's no superstition, there's no bad omens. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would often deduce good meanings from situations. By way of example, when they had the negotiations of the peace treaty in Hudaybiyah and Mecca, and there was a deadlock and they just couldn't break through, and one of the envoys who came to negotiate was a person by the name of Sahal. Sahal in Arabic means ease, comfort. Nabi Sallallahu said, what's your name? He said, Sahal. Nabi Sallallahu said, okay, now ease has come into the matter. So this was a common practice. If somebody had a good name or there was a good indication, then Nabi Sallallahu would latch onto this and extend its meaning. So Burayda in Arabic means to be cool, to be chilled. Nabi Sallallahu said, what's your name? Buray what's your name? He said, Burayda. Seventy ambush him to kill him. He looked at Abu Bakr, he said, Baruda Amruna. Here is Burayda, so that means our matters are cooled and relaxed. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, from which tribe do you come? He said, Min Aslam. Now in Arabic, Aslam means, it could either mean peaceful, could mean one that submit, could mean one that enjoys safety. From which tribe do you come? He said, Min Aslam. Nabi Sallallahu said, Salimna, then we are safe. Then we are safe. Psychology, diplomacy, interaction, sometimes a little approach. What was the vision of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Nabi Sallallahu said, From which branch of Aslam? Now it's already reducing the tension, the hostility levels are coming down, the tension is breaking, the ice is melting, inroads are being made ambush to assassinate 70 from which tribe from which branch of the aslam tribe he said mim bani sahmin saham in arabic could mean arrow or it could mean share if you understood the arabic you would appreciate the the dialogue much more better so it means share or arrow nabi sasam latched onto the meaning of share and he said kharaja sahmuka you mean you come from bani saham which means share so i guess you also have a share in islam then Burayda and his 70 people are melted and they read Kalima there before they enter Medina. They say to Nabi alayhi salam, can we fought, form part of the convoy that escorts you into Medina? Can we form part of the convoy? When they get to Medina, the people of Medina don't know. They say, oh, these people are all coming with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Only to know these were the 70 who ambushed him with the intention to assassinate him. 
But the profound character of Muhammad وسلم, converted his would-be assassins into his bodyguards. Then Buraida said, Oh Nabi of Allah, can we create a bit of a flag? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Take your spear and my turban, and that's a perfect flag. And these 70 escort Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasalam into Medina. What did I say to you, my brother and my sister? These were not dedicated opportunities, but this magnetic person was such that anybody came into contact with the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Immediately there was this profound impact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us that true living example that we can manifest, we embody, we exhibit, we discharge, we deliver, we convey, we present, we articulate verbally and bodily the noble character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah bless, bless the planet. May Allah bless this country and the, the good that the Muslims and, and others enjoy here. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy that we can coexist with all other humans and creatures on this planet where Allah has put us for a period of time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah, wa fi al-akhirati hasanah, wa qina athab al-nar, اللهم إنا نسألك العفو والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة والفوز بالجنة والنجاة من النار اللهم ردنا ورد المسلمين إلى دينك ردا جميلا اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا وجعلنا سببا لمن اهتدى اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من كل شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين